Let me, uh, it, um, in fact, I should tell you a story. People ask us about why did you choose aluminum? The reason that we chose aluminum was we chose aluminum because it was cheap. In fact, we had such a good deal. When I went from Stanford to LSU, why uh, we had a member of the Board of Supervisors who turned out to be a, it was a vice president of uh, Kaiser Aluminum, which had a big plant in Louisiana. And so one of the, one of the reasons, one of the things I was told was if I, if I went to LSU, then they would supply us with all of the aluminum that we needed for free. Well, that was a, that was a good deal. Uh, and so, so basically the reason aluminum was, was chosen was because it was cheap. Weber chose it, we chose it. I alluded to this earlier, uh, Weber's, uh, Weber's bar was five feet long. Therefore, ours was 10 feet long. Why? Not to make it bigger than Weber's or anything like that, but it was if Weber saw it was seeing gravity waves, and gravity waves in pulses, and then uh, if ours was 10 feet long, and then the gravity waves at the signals that Weber was looking at, 1660 hertz, should not have coupled to our bar, to the second mode of our bar. So if, because it's a purely quadrupole motion like this, the second, the, the, uh, uh, the second harmonic has the two moving in opposite phases. They just should, it should not couple. The, the, uh, uh, the symmetry is wrong. So we made it 10 feet long to check whether Weber was really seeing gravity waves, which another way to look at it is gravity waves couple as a forced gradient, difference between one end and the other. And just by pushing on the ends, you can't get, you, you can't excite the second mode. Okay, so uh, uh, Weber, Weber chose aluminum because it was cheap. Why did he choose it to be five feet long? The story that I've heard from Bob Forward is that Weber went down and asked the people at Alcoa, who made his bar for him, how big a bar can you make? And they said, how big do you need? And he, and he said, I don't know, how big can you make? And they said, oh, about five feet. He said, okay, five feet. Now, I was five years later when we built our bar, and at that time, why they could make one ten feet. So they could have made one ten feet then if he'd asked for it. But, uh, um, okay. Now, I've made a model for you here. Now, for you, for you theorists, okay, you've got a model. You have, uh, you, you, you have, here is the mechanical part of the system. Here is the electrical part of the system, and this part over here, I should say, incidentally, we, we, uh, I, I talked about a squid, and we, we modeled the squid as an amplifier with current and voltage noise. All right. Now, let me, let, let me explain to you what gets involved in this. It gets a little bit complicated, okay? Because now I have a current generator. This current generator can take and drive current through here, which in turn can go through the transformer and go back over here and change the current here, and in turn that can push on the, on the little mass. And if that pushes on the little mass, it can push on the big mass. So this guy, just the fact that I have an amplifier, in fact, in work that was done at Caltech many years ago, why the whole theory of linear amplifiers was developed, and uh, Caltech and Bell Labs. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, if I have a linear amplifier, it is necessary that there be a current generator and a, and a voltage generator here like this. Okay? Noise generators. No, then they're noise generators, yeah. It is necessary. Whoops, wrong way. It is necessary that if there are losses in the spring, and there are, that then there is, and I didn't put it in here, there is, in addition to this force, there is a random fluctuating force. So they study yeah. fluctuations of the Oh, okay. 
Okay, so you all know about the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So immediately you should have seen, the minute I've got that, then I have in here a generator that I have to put. Okay. Any loss here, I have a series uh, uh, voltage source there. Johnson noise, again. Okay, any place that there are losses, I necessarily have a resistor in my model. So, when I write down the equations of motion, and here they are. Here are the four equations of motion that you end up writing down when you do everything for, you do F equals MA, here are the forces, okay? Here's the voltage equation here, and here's flux conservation in one of the loops. Okay. We went ahead to solve those. Now I want to give you some feeling of whether we understand what we're doing. Here's the noise coming out, in, and I, I deliberately have not put any units up here of what we call digital units. It's completely arbitrary. Um, the, uh, this is the noise coming out of the leg rail, uh, averaged over about uh, 40 minutes in uh, uh, 1993, I believe. Many moons ago, but these were the best pictures I had. This was part of Norbert Solomonson's thesis work. Notice, nothing is perfect, okay? I have here two resonances. Why do I have two frequencies? From what I've said before, why do I have two frequencies? When I'm measuring the signal coming out, the signal getting through my squid amplifier, why do I have two frequencies here? What do I see? What do two frequencies correspond to physically? What am I seeing physically from what I have explained? I've had, yes, exactly so. I have two coupled oscillators. I've got the energy slashing back and forth between two coupled oscillators. We've all done that. You have, you, you, you have, well, you have a signal going back and forth. You have a sine wave which is modulated at another frequency. What do you get? You get the sum and difference frequencies. Okay? Sum frequency, difference frequencies. Okay? 894, 918. Look at this guy. What frequency is he? Just look at it. 900, someone said. 900. Where, did, where is he coming from? So how, how is 900 related to 60? It's the 15th harmonic of 60 cycles. And so we have, we, we have done a bad job, and, and, and in fact, we just found out about six weeks ago, we just found out where this was coming from, and, uh, uh, and we fixed it. But what you're seeing here then, this is the 15th harmonic of, of 60 cycles. This, I don't know what that is, and the rest of it is just noise. So there's our, there's our, uh, there's our, uh, uh, the noise of our amplifier, of our uh, whole gravity wave system in arbitrary units. Now, I want to find out how sensitive it is. I want to measure its sensitivity. How would I do that? What would I do? Well, I'll tell you. What we do is on the other end of the bar, the other place that we have our transducer mounted on one end, you saw that, on the other end of the bar, we put another transducer, not exactly the same. We put one that's a capacitor plate. Okay, that is a capacitor. And then on that capacitor, we put random noise. We put white noise. We blast the bejesus out of it with white noise. Okay? Now, if you have, so here's the end of the bar, okay? Here's a, something, a, a box on the end of the bar. Inside the box and, isolate, and insulated from the bar, you have another plate, okay? You put a voltage 
on that capacitor. You've made a capacitor here. You put a voltage on the capacitor. What is, if you put a voltage on the capacitor, what does it do to the capacitance plates? We already talked about it. It puts force on it. Okay? So here I am putting a random fluctuating force on the bar. What would you expect that to do? Well, it's going to, going to excite the bar. I'm going to put energy into it. I'm going to excite the Dickens out of it. In fact, I'm coming to the to another point that is crucial in making one of these detectors. You have to be able to calibrate it. You have to be able to know what it is you're measuring. And so, how we calibrate it is we measure the noise. Here, we just measure what's coming out of it. Look at the size of those numbers, incidentally. And then I hit it with a whopping big random noise signal. OK, notice what's happened. Much bigger numbers. OK, what it's done is ex it's excited the normal modes of the system. All this white noise has excited the normal modes of the system. Now, how does this go about telling me how the bar behaves? I've measured the noise. I'm putting now. If I put perfect white noise on, what spectrum is that? What frequencies are involved in perfectly white noise? Flat, all the way across. Okay, flat spectrum. I've excited it with all possible frequencies that the bar is interested in. It's really not, but it's within the with, you know within the regions that we can that we can look. Okay. So I've excited it. Now, what I need to do, so if I take this as a signal, and I divide at each frequency, I divide it by the noise that I get with it just sitting there ordinarily, what am I going to get? I'm going to be getting the signal to noise as a function of frequency. And if I then look at a plot, well, the signal to noise ratio is equal to 1. In other words, I do a point by point division. I get something like this. And what does this tell us? This tells us that our bar is sensitive as the Dickens right here, sensitive at less than the Dickens, but still pretty sensitive here, and not very sensitive in all the rest. Actually, it's still pretty good. And so this tells us what we need to do. This gives us a clue of what we need to do to, uh, uh, to make a better detector. We need to somehow be able to broaden the bandwidth. We would like to be able to get it so that it would go all of this far, maybe even further. And that's what the research is that we're working on now and that you'll uh, uh, hear about if you come to the talk tomorrow. OK, now how well do we understand what's going on? Well, we solved those equations that I showed you before. I'm not going to sh show you all of that. And what we've done is we've said, OK, solving those equations, what would be the frequency spectrum at the between the ground and the bar? In other words, back at the input, back where the gravity wave signal is. What would be the spectrum of the, sig of the signal that would, uh, that would reproduce what it is the equations say? Well. Here is the antenna Brownian noise. Now, that should really be flat. But on the other hand, you see we're between 10 to the minus 22 and 10 to the minus 21. So again, for government work, it's pretty well flat. OK. Brownian noise of the transducer, because I had dissipation there between the bar and the, uh, and the transducer mass. And this is how it comes out. Are these units per root hertz? Uh, yes. Yes. This will be in strain per root hertz. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a grand total graph here in a minute. Here are all of the electrical noises, the resistors that I had, uh, uh, that I had in here. Here's what their noise spectrum looks like reflected back to the beginning. OK. The current generator. Got to run power back through, back action, we refer to it. OK. The squid current noise. OK, again. 
Here we are, all put on the same graph. Okay, strain per root hertz. Those were the units that I was giving you. You can see what our problem is. Down here, incidentally, the thing that everybody always worries about, first of all, is the ball down in motion. You see that that's really not bothering us much at all. It's way down here. What, uh, what is the guy giving us trouble? It's limiting us right here. Well, it's the red one and the magenta one here. OK. Let's go back and look at what the red and magenta are, the squid current noise and the transducer Brownian noise. OK. So how do we, uh, how do we take care of those? Well, what we do is we need to make a transducer that has a higher Q, less dissipation, that thus cutting down its voltage, and uh, we have to get a better squid. There are the things that are limiting us. Now, I said I was going to show you some things wrong. We've got this thing working. You can see the level of sensitivity that we had. Let me go back again. Let me go back one step. In this range here, about 1 hertz and about 1 hertz here, notice that we were in 1993, we were at a strain per root hertz. In other words, a fractional length in change of the bar per root hertz of, say, 10 to the minus 21 and 2 times 10 to the minus 21. For those of you that have looked at the LIGO curves, that's really pretty damn good. We tried to fix it in 1956, and it got worse. 19. Oh, 1996, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't have been ahead of Weber if we'd done it back then. Um, the, uh, um, Notice that the 900 hertz is still there a little bit. So the, uh, uh, the, bar, the bar had and has had good sensitivity. There's one other thing, though. Sensitivity is not the only thing. Not only do you need to be sensitive, but you also have to be able to keep it operating. And you have to be able to keep it operating for a long, long time. And if anything, this is more difficult. My, my experience was that it took us a long time to overcome. It's a sociological problem. We, we, were, built, we were building detectors. And now you get it built, and you have to have the forbearance, if you will, to just step, step back from it and say, look, we now have an operating instrument. We know how to make it better. We can see all the things that are wrong with it. We don't mess with it. Don't, don't mess around with it at all. Keep it operating for a long, long time. In fact, in uh, 19, we kept it operating 1991 to uh, uh, the end of 1994, continuously, about a 90% uptime. We then uh, thought we were going to make a quick fix. Took us a year and a half. Uh, that was, I told the NSF it was going to be three months. Took us a year and a half. And uh, then when we got it back together, it was not as good as it had been. Um, we know what we did wrong, we think, and we're, we're, uh, we're now trying to fix it again. But because we had kept it operating for a long, long time, we could do some things that Remember, remember where my numbers were. My sensitivity numbers were way back up here. Okay. On the other hand, we could keep it operating for a long, long time. And because we kept it operating for a long, long time, we could do some averaging. We could average a few months of data. We didn't have any big glitches. We could average a few months of data. We thought that we would use this to try to look for a, uh, for a continuous wave gravity wave source. This was Evan Maselli's thesis. And, uh, and the errors are in here because we looked and we said, boy, there may be a bright source here and there at these two frequencies. We said, gee, maybe, maybe 
We have found gravity waves before these LIGO guys found them. And, but we weren't sure and we didn't publish. Now, now, let me tell you right now, I'll show you pictures in the talk tomorrow that don't have these things in them because what we found was we found, uh, Mar Martin McHugh found when he looked at it later, that uh, there had been an error in the way that buffers were being added and that these things, these came out at the end of a buffer. It was an end problem, very difficult one to find. But uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, these will go away when the, when, when the data is, is and, and will go away when, when the uh, data is analyzed. They were not, incidentally, those were significant, but not significant enough to write anything about. They were significant enough that word got out about them. And I had to give a talk at the meeting in Pune, I guess, to say, no, we are not claiming gravity waves. And, uh, but I thought it would be worth putting this up for you all to see that no matter how careful you can be, there can be mistakes. And there will be mistakes. And you've got to uh, uh, you do the best job that you can in trying to uh, uh, make sure that that the uh, mistakes don't uh, um, uh, don't get out. So what we did anyway, with that data was taken with averaging several months of data, get the sensitivity down, try to look for bright lines. Um, we did uh, later on try to publish it, and then since you all are theorists. Let me uh, dump on you at, uh, it was, uh, we, the, I'll, I, I, will, uh, I will give you a, a reference in the talk tomorrow. But the, uh, when the paper was refereed, why someone read it and said, well, a bright line for a month you would not expect. You would not expect to see a bright line for a month. It is not a physically reasonable thing. Therefore, these guys should put in, instead of a bright line signal to, to look for, they should put in a dying exponential, the sort of thing that you should look for. And then, uh, and, and until they do that, you shouldn't publish it. And uh, Evan was going off to his, uh, uh, to his job, and we just said, to hell with it. We'll, uh, we will, uh, um, it's, it's on the, uh, uh, it's on, in the GRQC um, uh, preprint list, and we'll just leave it there. Bill, the same thing happens to theorists who write papers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have one, perhaps the most important paper I've ever written that uh, uh, referees uh, think is worthless. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the business you all are getting into. Uh, and, and see if Kip has problems, uh, and, and, and old guys like me have problems, well, you know you're going to. Uh, here, is a, uh, here, here is something that we can do with our detector. And uh, what this is is a, uh, uh, is a plot generated uh, for us by Bruce Allen uh, that shows what you can do with trying to correlate data between the Allegro detector in Louisiana and the Livingston, the uh, LIGO uh, Livingston site. And this was an idea actually that, that came up over beer uh, one night in Cambridge with uh, Sam Finn and Albert Lazzarini. And they were saying, boy, wouldn't it be great if you guys could rotate your detector? Our detector, you will see tomorrow, as was run for a number of years, perpendicular to a great circle. We drew a great circle, ran up the Italian peninsula, a great circle, diameter cut, uh, a uh, plane cutting the earth going through, its, going through its center, okay? And all of the, it turns out that all of the gravity wave antennas in operation were pretty close to the great circle that we were able to draw. So then, if you orient your detector perpendicular to the great circle, imagine here's the Earth, here says so the great circle, all the detectors are oriented perpendicular to it. So as the Earth rotates, the bars all remain parallel 
Okay, the bars are all parallel and track the same sky. And uh, so the, uh, the idea, the, the way that we had run for a great many years was all of the bars oriented perpendicular to this great circle and so that they would all have about the same sensitivity at the same time and then we could do a reasonable correlation. The bar, the bar detectors operational in the world, and I should have said this early on and I will say it in the talk tomorrow, are that there's our bar Allegro at LSU then there is uh, our Explorer and Nautilus in the Rome area. There is uh, Origa in the, uh, up in uh, Lignano, uh, up right outside Padua. And, uh, and then there is Niobe run in Perth, Western Australia. Niobe will not be running uh, in, the, uh, in the future, but uh, uh, it's um, for all of this data, it was running. And what Bruce Allen uh, showed for us was what is the overlap? In other words, how, how well would a gravity wave signal at various frequencies uh, uh, correlate with the uh, bar at uh, Livingston, uh, at, uh, with, between Livingston and, and Allegro? Here is with the orientation uh, that we were running with before. Here is how it would, they would correlate if we lined the two up. And the top one was the correlation between uh, Hanford and, uh, and uh, Livingston. So we can do a search for, uh, we can try to look for a stochastic background or for things that excite the two, uh, the, the two sites in coherence. And you see, we're in in pretty good shape over a relatively wide area. The point is that the bar and Livingston are quite close together, so they really see the same thing. So they've got a good overlap. They're not close to zero, like yeah. Like, you notice this is zero up here. So uh, uh, right, and uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, when we moved our detector into its new room, we set it up so that it could rotate. And we demonstrated during the last engineering run that it not only can rotate, it can rotate cold and recovers very well uh, within half an hour of a rotation. So uh, it uh, definitely works. I want to finish up with a couple of words about a different kind of resonant detector. I want to talk about the, the idea of the taiga, the uh, uh, TIGA stands for Truncated Icosahedral Gravity Wave Antenna, basically a soccer ball, truncate, a truncated icosahedron. And what Warren Johnson discovered, Warren Johnson and Steve Merkowitz discovered, is that if you put transducers, six transducers on it, in this, uh, in this sort of arrangement, you can, uh, uh, you can recover the, uh, uh, a signal coming from any direction. Yes, sir. Truncated icosahedron. This is, in other words, notice these are all these are on the pentagonal faces. Yeah, but icosahedron shouldn't have both pentagonal and hexagonal faces. Or should it? We'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. No, this is right. This is what it is. This is what it is. You can demonstrate to yourself in Mathematica. You can, uh, uh, in, in fact, if you visit the Galileo Museum in where Galileo was, dis was looking at regular, uh, regular uh, uh, bodies, what do they call them? Anyway, you, you see this hung up. Galileo had the first idea and, and uh, never really got credit for it. Here, as a matter of fact, is one. There you are. This is... Uh, this was uh, uh, cut off of our, uh, of our original gravity wave detector, which was uh, uh, 34 inches in diameter, and, we, and instead of 20, the 24 that you saw. And uh, um, this was part of Steve Merkowitz's thesis. There are no transducers on this yet, but you can see what, the way we did it. We drilled a hole all the way through it, except that the hole was bigger on the bottom than on the top. So the idea, again, for getting good vibration isolation 
is that you take this body and you suspend it from the center of mass, or as close to the center of mass as you can get. Then any shaking that you do may shake the center of mass, but it's not going to excite any of the, uh, uh, any of the modes that are excited by gravitational waves, any of the quadrupole modes. The quadrupole modes of this turn out to be around 3 kilohertz. And just to uh, demonstrate what, uh, uh, what we saw, the, uh, what we see here is the bar was struck with, uh, at some place, and here's the output of the, uh, of the six transducers that were on it when it was struck. Here's zero. Okay? You can see it's sort of a messy looking signal. Okay? Add those together in the proper way and notice what you have. You're able to, to uh, uh, take those back to the five quadrupole modes. And so here you see that we excited the five quadrupole modes in various amplitudes. Okay. Moreover, the uh, zero marks the uh, uh, point where the uh, bar was struck. The X's mark the point that, the, uh, that uh, adding those channels together in the proper way thought that the bar was struck, or we were able to work. So we can tell, pretty well, or it may be the other way around, doesn't make any difference. The, uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, when you, uh, if you do something like that to, uh, to an antenna, to a quadrupolar antenna, you can do the linear algebra, and that's all it is. You can do the linear algebra to uh, uh, say where a, uh, uh, where a signal may be, uh, may be coming from. Okay, so the uh, yes, sir. Uh, in this hypothetical detector, uh -huh. we're talking about 1200 hertz, right? We are talking about 3,000 hertz. 3,000 hertz. hertz. For that particular on on that particular detector, yeah. Do you expect any sources in this frequency band? We don't know. A a uh, no, we don't. Uh, we don't know of anything at, the, at those frequencies. That's no reason that one shouldn't look. Neutron stars have normal modes at those frequencies. Right. And uh, black hole, a, a, a suitable sized black hole will ring down in that frequency region. Could you, could you think of something like something similar to the positive micro that but in the gravitational waves at those frequencies? I don't think we could measure it. Uh, but. You know, we just don't know. Kip, Kip, Kip could answer answer that much. No, remember, remember that the energy density goes proportional to the square of the product of amplitude and frequency. If you go to high frequencies, then uh, it, uh, that means for a given energy density, you have a small amplitude, and uh, so there's no hope to get uh, background of any plausible amplitude. Yeah, because the amplitudes are much too small for given energy density. Okay. Uh, now, what I what I left out of this talk in the in to uh, I I had uh, also in mind that I should tell you something about how rock in detectors work and in order to understand how those curves looked and things like that. But there's not uh, I I don't think we'll we'll win any souls. By uh, by talking on that, we've looked at that just a little bit in the in the guise of uh, RF modulation sure. for uh, for readouts and control of LIGO test masses. Right. Readout of LIGO. Samples. Okay. Okay. So they haven't heard those words, but but they've seen the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so anyway, so I. I think that uh, with this, I will uh, uh, I will stop. And uh, if there are no further questions, so, so let me just say that, uh, that Bill then will give the Kajaguar seminar tomorrow at, in 114 East Bridge at 11 a.m., which is, in some sense will carry on from here. But yeah. we'll give a a description of where things stand in this field today. Yeah, and 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 where they may. You've sort of got a preview to it, and in other words, what I, 
let me just tell you what I'm going to tell you tomorrow. And then if you're busy, why well, you don't need to come. But, but the, uh, uh, um, the uh, work has been done on squid. Squid amplifiers are a lot better. People have the uh, Italian group, the uh, Explorer detector, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Nautilus detector, and Origa detector, and Frascati, and uh, in, uh, in Lignol, are uh, running at a temperature close to 100 millikelvin. And by reducing the temperature, you've cut down the Brownian motion, and, and so you've you, and, and also, you've cut down the size of the Johnson noise that you would expect from any of these things. So they are more sensitive. And, uh, uh, and there are three projects going uh, in uh, Italy, Brazil, and the Netherlands on making spherical detectors of about the size that you saw here, except not using aluminum, using a copper bronze uh, material. Uh, that uh, uh, and I'll show you a picture of those uh, of those detectors tomorrow. The main idea that I'm hoping to get through in the lecture tomorrow will be that, and it was a point that I alluded to earlier, that the, that sensitivity is not the only thing. Sensitivity is good. Sensitivity is important. LIGO will ultimately be more sensitive than these detectors, and LIGO will, ulti will ultimately make these detectors obsolete. I want to make sure that everyone understands that. Ultimately, it, they should. But the more detectors you have looking for a signal, the more likely you are to find the signal, especially if the signal is in noise. And if I can get the loudspeaker to work tomorrow in this talk, you'll be able to hear it as well as see it. Um, yes, sir? LIGO works on completely different frequencies from bar and so Not that much. Not that much. You look at the LIGO uh, sensitivity and, the, uh, and, and ultimately at a kilohertz, it should be a lot better than the bars. But it isn't yet. It isn't yet. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah.